Amen. Hey, welcome to Discovery Amen. Church. Make some noise, you guys, if you're excited to be in church today. Welcome, welcome. I'm excited to be here. I haven't been, feel like it's been so long. Oh, it's been I only know. 12 days I've yeah. been uh, gone, been in Africa, but it's awesome yeah. to be back, you guys. Um, so I good. heard Pastor Brendan did amazing. He did so Last great. week, did amazing. He did so great. He had all of the best jokes, right? No? Okay. He always does. He didn't like them. But man, Uganda was fun, right? Uganda was a lot. It was so much fun, you guys. We'll be sharing a lot about it online and through email. If you guys want to subscribe to all that, fill out the connection card. Give us your email. We'll make yeah. sure to get you some of that information and get you updated and all the cool things that, are, that is happening in Uganda and what's next there with our mission to Uganda. But um, today, we're going to jump right in. I'm teaching yeah. with my lovely bride here, Pastor Veronica. I love oh. teaching together with her. It's so, it's so fun. It's, it's really a lot of fun. And today it's very intentional because we've been studying in the book of Ephesians. Uh, this is our, kind of our summer series, walking through the entire book of yep. Ephesians, kind of verse by verse by verse. And today we're going to talk about, the title is New Relationships. New, New Relationships. When you give your life or to Christian. Jesus, he changes everything. And one of the places that we can see change and transformation, or we should see change and transformation, it's in our relationships, right. the way that we treat people, the way that we conduct ourselves in relationships. And Paul's going to talk to us about this. Last week, Pastor Brennan introduced this second half of the book of Ephesians, beginning with Ephesians chapter 4. Paul gets really practical now. We've kind of talked about how the first three chapters was very theological. Paul was deepening their understanding of faith and doctrine and the gospel and who we are in Christ, our identity in Christ, and now he's shifting to like the practices of our faith. How does faith show up? How do we operate in a world in our identity in Christ and not in our old identity in the world? And so today he's going to kind of continue that thought of uh, that he that he began in chapter four, where he said, "Walk worthy of the calling you've received." That we're to we're to walk worthy of the calling that we've received, and he's going to specifically tell us how to do that, how to walk worthy of the calling that we've received in Christ in a few different relationships. So, so we have responsibilities in Christ. Wives have responsibilities in Christ. Husbands have responsibilities to walk worthy of the calling you have received. Parents and children have to walk worthy of the calling that we've received. And he's going to tell us today how even employees and employers today, he's going to tell us how to walk worthy of the calling that we've received. Fathers and mothers um, Paul's going to teach us how to walk worthy, and he's going to give us a word today. How many of us want a word from God? How many of us? You want a word from God today? God has a word for you today and for your relationships, and I hope that you have ears to hear and hearts to receive because every one of you can be impacted by this section of teaching where Christ can show up and change your relationships. Amen, somebody? Amen. Amen. And the first relationship, Come because on. of course, ladies go first. Here we go. Right? Ladies go first. Um, and this is every woman's favorite scripture. A word to Amen. the wives, right? A word to the wives. A word to the wives. A word to the wives. We kick it off, and Paul is so awesome with letting us go first. So here we go. He says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21 through 24, submit to one another out of reverence of Christ or for Christ. The call to submit to one another is a foundational principle. This is established for all believers regardless yeah. of your gender. So he's pointing out here not just for women or men. He's saying one another. One another. Um, we're to practice mutual submission. It's, a, it's an expression of our reverence to Christ. It's something that we both do. So I love that he kicks it off that way. And he says a mutual submission is, is just like a reciprocal relationship. It's a, a reciprocal submission. But then here we go. Here's where Paul says, women, get it right. Here we go. He says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husband, not someone else's because that Come would be on, weird. Come on, somebody. I feel the Lord in this place. That would be weird. Submit your, yeah. <laughs> wives! <laughs> submit Can you repeat your... that line? No, I'm just okay, kidding. I'll I'm say kidding. it again. I'll say it again because the men, <laughs> the men want the me to tell you. The Lord has just showed up in the house of God. The men want me to tell you. I will tell you again, wives. Okay. This is wow. what Paul says. Women. He's in this place, people. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. <laughs> you want to celebrate one more time? No, no, inwardly, okay, I think. Okay, inwardly. Any husbands elbowing anyone <laughs> right now? Anyone? Okay, all right. Paul says it, so, you know, it's done. Praise the Lord. Um, as, you know, you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. His body 
of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Now, there's a key word here that, that is like, I would say if there's ever a controversial word in the Bible, this is one of those. And it is, what is the head of the wife and what does that mean? And this is really important. So when you look at what the Greek term is here for head, it is ka, um, ka, ka, sorry, kafale. Is, kafale. Sorry. It's so hard for me to say it, you know? Yeah. It's like, oh, it pains me. No, just kidding. Lord Jesus, It doesn't pain her. me. It doesn't pain me. It doesn't. <laughs> no, but believe it or not, kafale isn't um, something that we would imagine in our culture and day um, as head, but it is interpreted as source. Yeah. It's an origin. Rather than implying authority or um, her, like a, a dominance, it's a husband being the head of the wife means it's a source of love, of care, of nourishment. And, and check this out. That's what, this is the example that Paul is giving, like the, the, the church and us. But in our modern day, we can look at it like electricity has power, like a stream has a river, like a sun in a solar system, like a baby nursing mother has a nursing mother, like God gives us life, like a husband is for a wife, is a source of love. And submitting to that love isn't going to take you away or make you lesser. It makes you interdependent to each other. It's a beautiful thing to have submission. I don't think that women have an understanding problem of what submission is. I don't think us as women, we don't see like, um, does submission mean, maybe some of you in this room are like, submission means having a dictator at home who tells you what to think and do. You can never speak. As a matter of fact, you should cover your head and never say anything or have any thought if that's your belief or if your belief is like me. That submission is something that is a source that I am going to, a, a loving and caring, nurturing source for me. And if that's you, either way, you, you, we, we find it not hard to understand submission, but to trust submission. And if you're a woman in the room who's like saying, I not only have a hard time submitting to my husband, but submitting to anyone, mm. to submitting to anything, not my boss, not my job, I have a hard time submitting to any authority because I have pain and brokenness. I'm going to challenge you to find healing in that because you will find so much freedom and it'll be a great place. You'll start to see not, your husband not as a, a dictator or someone who is just calling the shots, but a loving source for you, a fountain of life, a nourishment for your heart and your soul. Amen. Um, but let's, I mean, what do you think? Did I say no, that right? I Am I fantastic. good at submitting? No, no, no. I think you are. Yeah, I think <laughs> sometimes. So. Someone laughed over here. Who was that? Sometimes. <laughs> no, no. No, she is. And I love this. I, I, this interpretation the verse, this verse is a very controversial verse. Still in the body of Christ today, there is still this, um, uh, in some movements, a over-dominance of, of men towards women and not allowing them to step into their calling and leadership. And that's not what this verse is saying. And there has been, I think, a lot of revelation to this verse and what this, what this word head actually means, kafale, and how it's even used in Greco-Roman societies at this time and how Paul is using this word all throughout the scripture, like there's other words for authority and, and dominance or head. There's like other words that are used for that. But the interpretation of kafale as head, as some kind of dominance over women is not biblical men in here. It is not biblical men. You are a source for your wives. And I'll speak to that later. But yes. Yes. Amen. Amen. So let's talk about how um, us as wives should live worthy. So I'm going to talk to the wives for a little bit. One, we should submit willingly. Submit willingly. Say, man, I'm going to see him as that source, and I'm going to submit. Submission is a voluntary act of respect and support for the husband's role in your family. A voluntary respect. It's like I'm going to respect him. Submission is a strength wrapped in grace. It's a strength of us. It's a strength that we have as women to be able to submit, just like we are as a church submitting to Christ. It's the same thing. It's us as a church saying, I am not God. I don't know it all, and I don't feel like I am the source. The source is something else, and I'm going to wrap my strength in that with grace. Um, I love that, you know, um, in Galatians 3.28 says that there is neither Jew nor Gentile, nor neither slave nor free, nor male nor female. We are all one in Christ. Women, you are not infer inferior. 
You're not inferior. God didn't create you less of a person, less of a being. That's not what submission has anything to do with. Again, this goes back to a core. Whenever we start to feel inferior, we start to read the Bible through saying that women are less. We start to feel a hard, like, heart start to develop because then we're like, well, I'm not going to submit and be an inferior, uh, inferior to anyone. But that's not what submission is about. It's not about that at all because Christ has made that very clear that there is, there is nor female nor male. Both husbands and wives are equally valued and can serve one another in love. Colossians 3.18 says, Wives, submit your husbands, submit to your husbands as it is fitting to the Lord. Meaning that we are to submit, as Paul is saying here in the, in, um, in the Bible, that it's not just a cultural thing. It's not just Paul saying that to the culture there. He's saying this is a biblical principle for us as women. This is tied into our purpose, into how God will use us. And if we are able to see this, it's so amazing. I know that for me, Jason is my soul source wholeheartedly. And I submit to him in a way that I know he's going to love and lead me well. And so it's not hard for me to submit to him. It's hard for me to submit to him when it is, um, there's a hardness or a pain that, that is like a trigger, right? A trigger starts to come up when maybe we as women start to feel less. Well, when I can fully trust him that I'm not less but I can trust him as my source, there's a willing submission. And then number two is there's um, encourage constantly. This is our role, our role as women. It, it, it helps us fulfill what it is that God has called us to do when we can consistently encourage our husbands. And encouraging them is your respect to your husband is, isn't a struggle, but it's a desire um, in the midst to earn his deepest respect. Um, encouraging your husband is like breathing life into your marriage. To encourage him, it's like you're pouring deposits of life into him, telling them who he is. Proverbs 31, 26 says this to all of our Proverbs 31 women. It says, she speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. We can speak with wisdom to our husbands. Words of affirmation can profoundly affect our husband's emotion, spirit, emotion and spiritual well-being. I love this. Wives, do not call your husband stupid. Don't call him dumb. Don't call them lazy or worthless because you will be speaking. Even if he is. Be, even if he is. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, you're just not. Kidding. None of you are. You're not. None you're of you not. are. None of you are. Um, because he will become you know. every word that you breathe into him. He will. He will be, become every lazy, failing, lack of a man that you speak over him. And if that's what you want, continue to reap that in your life. But if you want him to raise to the level of your belief, you need to start speaking those words and that into his life. Because if not, he will fall to the level of what you speak to him. He will fall and stay there and continue to operate as a lazy man, not having his rightful place in his calling. And if you, that's what you desire, continue to do that. Ephesians 5.33 says this, the wife must see to it that she respects and delights in her husband, that she notices him and prefers him and treats him with loving concern, treasuring him, honoring him, and holding him dear. That was number Re three, right? Oh, sorry. Is that number three? Yep. Oh, Go I'm so sorry. It. Okay, number three, respect deeply. Respect deeply. That's the fill in there. Sorry, I, I jumped ahead. Respect deeply is number three, but Ephesians 5.33 is that we should. We should respect our husband and honor him deeply. Um, when a wife respects her husband, she empowers him to be the leader that God has called him to be. Amen? When we can respect our husbands, that's what we produce. For men, respect is like the soil that grows his heart. And in and, and the book, Love and Respect, anyone ever read the book, Love and Respect by Gary Chapman? He talks about this balance of love and, and, and us as women that we want and we desire. And then a respect that just fills our husband's Heart. A deep respect nurtures deep love. A deep respect for him is going to grow him and help him run in the path that God has for him. Even if a man isn't perfect, like Pastor Jason said, he, he called some of you out today. He said that some of you might be. Some of you might be, and that's okay. None of us are perfect. It's me yeah. too. Yeah. Okay. He's not perfect. Let me tell you where he's not perfect That No, just kidding. Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> Let's make him feel I'll better. I'll tell you Come what. On. I'll tell you what. He can never get the clothes Stop in that. the basket, ever. 
It's like right there. You're like almost there, honey. You're almost there. Anyway, 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 anyway. But anyway, if, and even if, again, even if they're not perfect, <laughs> even if they're not perfect, women, hear me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop with this, uh, and then we can go on to the husband. Even if they're not perfect, you inserting disrespect to him and trying to take his leadership will never make him the man you want. Never. We have to respect them. That's our place because that's an honorable place. That's a gift from God for you to respect and love your husbands that way. Anyway, tell us about guys. Okay, okay. So how many got a word for your wives there? Your wives, you got a word there? Did yeah. God give you a word? Okay. Husbands, let me give you a word. Paul wants to give you a word. A word to husbands today. Now, to walk worthy of the calling that you've received. How many of you husbands in the room? Raise your hands, raise your hands, raise your hands. This is for you, this is for you. How many want to be a husband one day? Want to be, want to be, want to be. There you go. This is for you too. Ephesians chapter 5 continues, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Look at this. Just as Christ loved the church Mm -hmm. and gave himself up for her to make her holy. So just as Christ loved the church and his love for us makes us holy. Look, husbands love for their wives, makes her holy. You know, holy means, holy just means, you guys, to be set apart. Listen, Christ's love for us empowers us as the church, as people of God, to be holy and set apart for him. This is what Paul is saying. When a husband has Christ-like love for his wife, it empowers her to be set apart for him. If you want your wife to be set apart for you and you alone, It cannot function. You cannot have a biblical uh, marriage and be a godly husband without demonstrating Christ-like sacrificial love. And and, and some, you know, ladies, if you're in here and you're like, ah, the submission thing is hard. This, God is calling men to lay down their lives for women, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish. But holy and blameless. In the same way, he says, husbands ought to lay down their lives as their own bodies. Ought to, ought to love, sorry, their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one hated his own body. But he, he, they feed and care for their own body, just as Christ does for the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. But I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. We, we kind of interpret love differently, as Veronica was saying. Women need the affection of love, and husbands need the respect of their wives. So what is the word Paul is giving to husbands today? Write it down. i got three for you, and every one of these will have you, we'll give you three. Number one is this, to love sacrificially. Husbands. God is calling you to walk worthy of the calling you have received and love your spouse sacrificially. Sacrifice isn't losing, it's loving. Husbands is to love, they're to love their wife as Christ loved the church, meaning lay down your life for her. This kind of love, it demands a selflessness, it demands a sacrifice, a commitment to put her needs above your own needs. And any wife that has a hard time with submitting to their own husbands, ought to examine the words of the Apostle Paul stating that a man should lay down his life for his wife. Husbands are called to love sacrificially, and it's easy for a woman to submit willingly if she has a man that loves sacrificially. Can I get an amen, amen, sisters? Amen, amen. What if God, though, designed marriage not for your pleasure, not for your selfishness? What if God designed marriage to make us holy, not happy? What if it was the instrument that God used to reflect his glory, the glory of Christ's love for the church? What if the marriage was meant to create holiness in our lives, not necessarily selfishness and happiness? A husband's sacrificial love plays a crucial role in, in that development, in that holiness development, not, not only for his wife, because as he loves her, he's bringing out the best in her, but as we sacrifice It is working out character and the character of Christ inside of us. Husbands, love her like Christ. Love her like Christ. 
That means sacrificially and unconditionally. But this sacrificial love, it's not just like about grand gestures. It's, it's these daily acts of kindness. It's your words. It's the simplicity of your, your, your patience and your understanding and you prioritizing her needs or, or, or putting your dirty clothes in a hamper. I'm sorry. Please. It's, it's any of those things. It's those simple things. Colossians chapter 3, verse 19 says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. One of, I'm telling you, it's a pet peeve of mine, is to see a man speak to his wife harshly. It's to be harsh, to be demeaning to her in the way he speaks. And it's not just the words that are coming out of your mouth. It's the tone that is coming with it. You, you, men have strength. God has given you strength, and you use that strength in ways that you don't understand. She is different than you. She cannot handle that. You're crushing her with your harshness. You're not called. You're called to bring out the best in her, to love her sacrificially. That's what the word that Paul is saying. This is how you walk worthy of the calling you've received. Yeah. If you're a child of God, if you've been chosen and adopted and accepted, then this is how you, your faith is demonstrated. Husbands, in your sacrificial love. Number two, it's demonstrated to you leading gently. Leading gently. That, that involves you understanding and, and, and valuing your wife's perspective. It means you're, you're listening to her. You're responding with kindness and, and, and empathy. You, you're, you're allowing her to feel valued and heard. You are the source, men. Remember, kafale, the source, not the necessarily the authority or the you know, dominate it. You're the source. Not so, so what does that mean? There's a few things that you're the source of, man. You're the source of life and support. I love, just like a river is a source that nourishes and sustains life, you are the life-giving flow of nourishment to your wives. You're the source of protection and security. That you provide stability and protection, a safe and secure environment, home for your women to feel emotionally uh, safe, spiritually, physically. Yeah. You, just said, you just said you're women. You're women. I, mean, I, got, I got three women in my house. I don't know about you. I'm sorry. Okay. Didn't mean to. You're a woman. I'm not a polygamist or anything. But anyway, source of, 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 of encouragement and strength, you guys, to encourage and strengthen. You are the source of that, a pillar of support. In times of need for your spouse, you're the source of spiritual leadership, leading by example in spiritual matters to lead your homes, your family, provide a strong foundation and direction for your wives and your family. Gentle leadership builds strong marriages. A husband's leadership should be grounded in love and humility, just as Christ loved the church. This is your represent. This is the spiritual leadership that we have in our homes and with our wives, just as Christ, the spiritual leader of the church, laid down his life. He didn't, he was not dominating over his disciples. He was the servant of all. Right. He said, I came to serve, not to be served. Mm -hmm. When a husband leads with dominance instead of instead of this gentle leadership when he leads with dominance instead of love it creates a very toxic relationship one that's that, that's like built on fear instead of mutual respect and if you do have children and daughters you're, they will be affected and wounded by your intolerance and by your dominance and by your anger some husbands they prioritize power over partnership and control over compassion you think you're strong but you are weak. Yeah, wow. You are weak. You're a weak man if that's you. It takes strength to be humble. It takes strength to be gentle. Mm -hmm. First Peter chapter 3, verse 7 says, Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives. Mm -hmm. And treat them with respect as the weaker partner. Some translations say weaker vessel. Now, this isn't a statement of inferiority here. Yeah. This is a, you know, it's a cultural recognition, but also a physical difference, acknowledging that in general, women are weaker than men physically. Men are stronger, and this acknowledges a, a, a role that men have in the strength of your leadership, that you are to protect your wives. You are to provide protection and support, not dominating and patronizing, but protecting and supporting Treat them with respect as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. As heirs with you. There is equality 
in our spiritual standing. We are co-heirs in Christ. There is neither male nor female. There is absolute differences in our gender and what she is good at and specializes at. Absolutely. But in our spiritual standing, there is absolute equality. We are both equal recipients and heirs of the grace and salvation of Christ so that nothing, look what he tells the husband, treat them with respect so that nothing will hinder your prayers. When you mistreat your wives, you're, you are hindering your prayer life, your, your connection, God responding to you. God values how husbands treat their wives so much that he says, I'm not even going to answer you if you're being harsh to her. Right. So this leads to number three. What's the, the third word that God has for husbands? To cherish her deeply. Cherish her deeply. When, when you're you were married, many of you gave vows when you were promised to, like, love and cherish as long as you both shall live. What's the difference between love and cherish, though? One of the easiest ways for me to discover the difference between love and cherish is between 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that love chapter, and the Song of Solomon, which is a book about cherishing your, your spouse, cherishing your spouse. In 1 Corinthians 13, we see love. Love is patient. It's kind. It doesn't envy and boast. It's not selfless. It puts up with anything. But the Song of Solomon uh, says that cherish, cherishing is about in, being enthusiastic about your spouse, mm -hmm. boasting in her boldly, enjoying her fully, like her presence, her scent, her smile, her body, her voice. This is what cherishing means. Mm -hmm. Men, our wives want more than simply to be loved. They want to hear what Song of Solomon chapter 4, verse 9 says. You have captivated my heart, my sister, my bride. You have captivated my heart with one glance of your eyes. Come on, man. You need yeah. to take a note from yeah. Solomon here. That would get a woman to submit real fast. Let me just say that. For sure, that would work. <laughs> Ephesians 5, 33, in the Amplified Version, it says this. However, each man among you, without exception, without exception, every one of you men, is to love his wife as his very own self with behavior worthy of respect and esteem, mm -hmm. always seeking the best for her with an attitude of loving kindness. Mm -hmm. Cherish her like a treasure. Mm -hmm. She is a gift from God, man. Mm -hmm. A gift. Husbands should cherish their wives, recognizing that she is a gift of God, treating them with honor and delight. Yeah, and if you feel like you're in the room and you're like, man, I'm hearing this wives thing, I'm hearing this husbands thing, and you're like, I've kind of messed it up. We've been married a long time. I don't even know where to begin. There's a lot of stuff, Pastor Jason, Veronica, you don't understand. No marriage is perfect. No marriage is perfect, but this is a great foundational truth for us to get back on track when we get off track. Just get back on track. If you guys need to just say, I'm sorry today after service and say, gosh, man, have we have gotten way off track. But let's try to work on getting back on track. It, there's never, n there, you're never too far, there's never too far gone, never too much done that God cannot repair and do. Build your marriage on the word of God. Here's the third. Group. Yeah, and the third relationship, ready for this, is a uh, word for your children and parents. Children and parents. Now, Ephesians 6, 1 through 4 says, children, obey your parents. So if there's any children in the room, now is their time to shut off your phone, your iPad, whatever it is that your mom let you play with um, today. Shut that off. Shut your TikTok off. Shut your Instagram. Just real quick. I'll let you know when to tune me out again. Okay? All the kids listening? Okay. <laughs> Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. And for this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. I'm going to tell you a very important promise. If you honor your father and your mother, things will go well for you. And that means so much. Things will go well for you. And you will have a long life. Who wants a long life, kids? You want to live a long Come life? Amen. Come on. Are you guys paying attention? And then fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way that you treat them. Rather, bring them up with discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. If you're a child in this room, understand this. Let me tell you this one thing, and then you can tune me out. If you do this now as kids and you learn how to obey your parents now, it will be easier for you as an adult to obey your boss. It'll be easier for you to obey your authority. It'll be easier for you to love God and find him. If you as kids can't, like, get this now, it's kind of like training ground when you're a kid. If you're a teenager in the room, this is your training ground. 
This is your time to work hard at practicing obedience because when you grow up, if you're a disobedient adult, you're a messed up adult. You're an adult who will not have things go well for you. You will struggle a lot. So it's well for you to obey your parents now so that you master this idea of authority in your life. Okay, now you can tune me out because now I'm going to talk to your parents and they don't want you to hear what I'm going to tell them. No, that's okay? okay. It's okay. All right, okay. Okay, get back on your iPad. Anyway, so number one, parents, Paul is saying this, instruct purposefully. Instruct purposefully. Daily instruction builds a lifelong faith. Daily instruction. The little things, the, the, the small deposits of slowly guiding your children is going to build a lifelong faith. It isn't big moments. It isn't just like big, hey, let me, let me just show you. Let me just take you to church on Sundays. But it's a daily thing. Proverbs 4.23 says, the heart is the wellspring of life. Parenting is not a behavior control mission. It is a heart rescue mission. It is a heart rescuing mission. When we are talking to our children, we should not talk to their behavior. We should speak to their heart. We shouldn't ever call them bad or, or names and, and, and label their behavior as their identity. But we should speak to their heart and where their heart needs rescuing. Amen? Amen. Okay, so now um, when we talk about uh, Deuteronomy 6, sorry, let's go. Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 6. The commandment that I give you today is to, um, the, the commandment I give you today are to be on your heart and press them on your children and talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. We sometimes don't know how to connect with our kids as parents, especially as they grow and they start becoming smelly teenagers. And you're like, ew, who are you? Like, what happened to that cute little kid that was, like, with the cute cheeks and all of that? And we don't know how to instruct them. But this is such a clear way to do that. It says when you're sitting down for dinner. It says when you're just walking to Target. It says when you're just kind of coming and driving. Those are the moments. It, again, it's not the big moments that matter. It matters how you treat them in the car when there's traffic. You're not pinching them or slapping them in the back. Say, like, shut up. I slip. You know, don't do that to them. You know what I'm saying? It's saying to instruct them even in those moments in the car, that you're guiding their life every moment of them. Instruct purposely. Number two, discipline lovingly. Discipline lovingly. It's important that we discipline with love, not with anger. But our culture today has gotten so far away from disciplining our children. Our children are reckless. Mm -hmm. They are disregard authority. We need to get back to the word of God here. Loving discipline shapes strong character. Effective discipline. It, it, it's not just about hurting your children. It's setting clear expectation. It's, it's giving consistent consequences. It's a loving relationship. It teaches your children that there are choices and there are consequences to those choices. Mm -hmm. And a child thrives best in an environment where there's genuine love, but it's undergirded by boundaries with limits enforced by loving discipline. A child who has not been disciplined with love in their little world will become disciplined without love in the big world. Right. Right. Proverbs 13, 24 says, those who spare the rod of discipline, look at this, parents who don't discipline their children. Come on. Parents who let their kids act crazy at the restaurant. <laughs> Come on. Ruining my dinner. <laughs> who says amen? Parents who let their kids at checkout just crawl on the ground screaming. <laughs> Parents who let their kids smack you Ooh. Or, or talk back to you mm. without any kind of word. Those who spare the rod of discipline hate their children. If you think you're being a friend, you're setting them up for failure. Those who spare this discipline, this loving discipline, you actually hate your child. Those who love their children care enough to discipline them. The reality is this. It's not even about them. You're dis those of you that are not disciplining your children, it's not about them. It's about you. You'd rather be a friend in their life and be accepted by your children than actually shape them the way that God has called you to shape them. Okay, discipline. <laughs> discipline it's, loving. It's not about punishment, but, but, but about correction, right? It's about guidance. Yeah. It's meant to be restorative. Mm -hmm. It's meant to be redemptive. Yeah. 
it's, it's meant to show our children their, their heart's condition, their sins, and their need for Christ. I'll even speak to like blended families just for a moment here, because your children, every blended family in here, your children need a mom and a dad. Every one of your children need a mom and a dad. You cannot draw a line and say, you're not mom for these, or you're not dad for these. You need to be both love and authority. You need to have both care and discipline. Both mom and dad need to accept biblical roles, not cultural principles. Okay? Discipline lovingly. That's right. And then the last one here, because that was awesome for sure. Um, Model faithfully. Model faithfully. The most effective way to raise godly children is to be a godly parent. Come on. That's the most effective way. You can't have a godly kid if you're not a godly parent. You can't send them to Christian schools and bring them to church and then not be godly when you go home. It's just not going to work that way. Children are great imitators. As a matter of fact, I have this magical thing that I want to show you guys. It's like magic, really. I probably shouldn't talk about magic at church, but I'm going to talk about magic at church. (laughs) Witchcraft! You know women always doing crazy things. Um, (laughs) uh, But anyway, I have something really magical that can help you see what your children will look like when they grow up. It's perfect. You can see what kind yeah. of character they're going to have. This is for real. It's, it's for real. It's, yeah. It really works. You can it's, see it's, it. It's a magical thing. This I'm going to show works. it to you right now. Um, it, it's going to help you see what kind of person they're going to be, what kind of, how they're going to act, what they might even look like even yeah. when they're an adult. Are you guys ready for it? It's right here. Oh, look. I can see what Grace is going to be like, how Abby's going to be. Um, wow. I can even see a little bit of Caleb in me um, yeah. right there. I can see how Caleb's going to and how he already that. starts to speak. Let me see that. Oh, okay. I want to see, I wanna see um, what kind of man my daughters are going to marry. Let's see. Let's see. Let what does see. he look like? Oh, dang. Oh. <laughs> huh. <laughs> wow. It, it's magic. Take a look in the mirror. Right. And you'll be able to see what kind of children, what kind of men and women your children are going to become. Right. It's not hopeful. It's not like, man, I hope he gets a, I hope she marries a man of God. I hope, I hope my husband, or I hope my son gets a woman who is going to love him and respect him. I'm going to, I'm going to imitate that for him. I'm going to imitate the kind of wife and the standard that he should be looking for. I'm going to be the woman that I want my young girls to be like. And men, if you want a godly son, if you want a son who is a a strong man who walks in his identity, then you need to look in the mirror and he you will produce exactly who you are in your children. Again, if you want to see what they're going to look like when they're 30, 40, 50 years old, here's this. I'll leave it right here in case anyone wants to borrow it later on. It'll be right there. Joshua 24, 15 says, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. That doesn't mean that as you don't just put that on the walls of your house because Hobby Lobby is full with placards and things you can hang on your wall that say this very statement. But it doesn't matter if it hangs on your wall. If you are not serving the Lord, your household will not serve the Lord. Do you know what that means? It means actually being on the dream team and serving the Lord. And if you're not on that then your children will not be on the dream team when they're your age and serve the Lord because they will have no idea what that looks like. Can I get an amen? amen. Or an oh my. Amen. Sorry, I'm so, sorry. So I'm done. I'm Paul done. is just helping us walk worthy of the calling mm-hmm. that we've received. We're growing in knowledge and understanding, but Paul's like, what good is that if you're not walking worthy of the calling you've received? So he's got a word for the wives and husbands and parents and children. The last group he's going to speak to here, I'm just going to call it a word for your workplace. He's got a word for your workplace, that that you being a child of God should actually show up in how you work. And actually, he says it like this in in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5. He says, slaves, obey your earthly masters with fear, with respect and fear. Let me time out right here. This isn't, he's, Paul is not um, advocating for slavery. It was common in that time. But what he is saying is, even in this culture that is messed up, you, slaves and masters, he's going to give a word. You can still represent Christ right where you are. In our context, we can put this into a workplace. But this is a literal, he's talking about now the way that they had slavery was much different then. He's not agreeing with it, but he's saying you were a slave when you got saved. Now you still are a slave. You just need to be a Christ-honoring slave. Okay? You're, you're, so this is, it's, I, I know it's not 
cultural in our context, but we can put it in the context of our work. Look what he continues to say. Just as you would obey Christ, obey them, not only to win their favor when your boss's eye is on you and looking at you, but as slaves of Christ, do the will of God from your heart, serve wholeheartedly, as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. And you masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. Mm -hmm. So for your workplace, what is a word from God? How we can walk worthy of the calling we received in our workplace. Number one, work diligently. Work diligently. Diligence is worship in disguise. Work becomes worship when you dedicate it to God and you perform it with the awareness of his presence. That's how work becomes worship. God designed you to make a difference with your life, whatever it is that you do. When you do it for, with excellence as unto God, it is worship. Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. As working for the Lord, not for human masters. You know what this is saying? It's saying work as if God is your boss. How would that change how you showed up to work and how you accomplished your work and how productive you were if you work like God was your boss? Because you're not cheating your work. You're cheating God. You're not stealing from your work. You're robbing from God. Right. You're you're not being careless with your work. You're being careless towards God. So how does God show up in our faith? Through your diligent work. Right. And now speaking to those who lead... Um, Number two is lead fairly. Those of you who are supervisors or owners of businesses, it's important for us to understand that God wants us to lead fairly, to to almost see those um, that you're leading as leading um, humbly and and fairly. James 5, 4 says, Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who uh, who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Almighty. If you're an owner or a leader or a supervisor, shift manager, whatever it is that God is entrusting you at any level of leadership, when people you lead go home, they are crying to God about the things that you are doing, and God hears that. It is not a silent ear that God says, oh, well, you know what, I give them a pass because, man, it was a tough day for them as leaders. Or, you know, poor, poor, poor owners, they have a lot going on. You know, I'm going to have extra grace on them. No, God will hold you accountable even at a higher level when you are the owner or the manager leading people in any capacity. If you are the shift manager over the drive through of any fast food restaurant or you're the CEO and the owner, God will hold you accountable to how you treat and fairly love and humbly serve the people that God has entrusted you with. Now, let me help you just change, like shift your mindset here. The last word that Paul wants to give us to walk worthy of the calling in our workplace. And I really think that we need to shift and transform the way we think. Okay, because number three is this, serve wholeheartedly, to serve wholeheartedly. Some of you think of serving God in the terms of just the dream team or just certain aspects of your life. But here's the transformation that you need to see. When you go to work, you're on the clock. You're not just working for a pay. You are serving wholeheartedly your God. That is ministry. That is service. We are to bring our whole heart and serve, not just work, not just clock in and out, but to serve and glorify God while we're at work. Every task you do at work is sacred when it's done for God. It's sacred work. Some of you got sacred and secular separated. Oh, there's secular stuff, secular, and this is my sacred part of my life. There is nothing secular to the child of God. You, you are bringing the kingdom wherever you go. That's not secular. It's sacred. You know why? Your work is sacred. I don't care how bad it is over there. I don't care how bad it is. It might be, it, it, they might be terrible bosses. They might be evil. I'm tired of people being like, oh, my, mom, my work is so terrible, and, and, and they're evil. Duh, that's why God has you there. Serve wholeheartedly. Serve. Glorify God. The way you work shines God's light to the world. Matthew 5, 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds. All this world 
that workplace that you've been complaining about, change your mind, child of God. Change your mind. Some of you have been on job to job to job to job, and you complain about every one. Stop it. Change your mind. You're not leaving that job. You're abandoning your mission, your assignment to God. Now, I'm not speaking to every, uh, that's not a word for every person. That was a word for some. God might have you leave. But I just need you to know, that work that you're doing, it's not punishment. It's ministry. It's ministry. God wants to, he doesn't just want to like, fill you with knowledge and change like the way you think in your mind and give you good theology and information and even your church experience here. For a lot of you, it's like very intellectual. But God wants to change the way you live. God wants to change your faith to transform your relationships. And I believe there's a lot of us in here today that need some of this in different areas of our relationships. We need God to come in, the power of God to come into our relationships and change our hearts and our lives. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.